Hello, Mount Pleasant family. Thank you so much for joining us today for church. I am glad that you are watching with us. I want to ask you a question as we start. If I were to ask you what your greatest weakness is, how do you think that you would answer that? Now, if you've got somebody watching next to you or, or, or with you, maybe they can answer that a little bit faster than you can, but let's not do that in this moment, okay? Let's save that for another time. Most of us, we don't like to think about our weaknesses, right? Weaknesses are not the things that we post on social media. They're not the things that we highlight to other people. Think of it like a job interview. Most of us have had a, a job interview or a first job interview. Maybe some of you have had plenty of them. But you know that as a part of a job interview, they're probably going to ask you the question, you know, tell me a weakness about yourself. And if we're honest, we all know that it's a trick question, right? No one really expects them to reveal some type of flaw about themselves that would prohibit them from getting this job. It's a, it's a trick question. They want you to put a spin on the answer. So you have to say something like, well, you know, I work too hard, right? Or uh, something like, I, I expect too much of myself. Like, like those are real weaknesses. Revealing true weaknesses about ourselves is one of the last things that we want to do. I think this happens to me from time to time on the basketball court. Maybe you don't recognize this, but I'm usually not the strongest, toughest guy out there. But every once in a while I'll be playing and uh, I'll be playing defense on somebody and somebody will, will see a matchup and they'll look at me and they'll say, oh, oh, post him up, which in basketball jargon is, is, is slang for, you know, oh, he's, he's too weak, he's too small, go dominate him, go take advantage of him, which is like revealing my weaknesses to everybody on the court. It doesn't make me feel very good. Weaknesses, they're a part of life. And as we wrap up this series, Unbreakable, we have to talk about this. Because some people, some of us let our weaknesses break us. We, we let them become our downfall. We let them become the thing that hold us back from ever living the type of life that God wants us to live. And sometimes our weaknesses keep us from the things that God has for us. I bet many of you can remember this classic scene and maybe even finish the sentence from the movie Forrest Gump, right? Where Forrest is sitting on the bench and he's talking to this lady stranger that's next to him and he looks at her and he says, <clears throat> Mama always said that life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get, right? Well, I didn't deliver that very well, but maybe you finished the sentence at wherever you're watching this. And sometimes life is hard and life is going to deal you things that are just difficult and make it hard on you. That, that's the reality of this. You just never know what might happen to you. It's kind of like a deck of cards, right? I've got a deck of cards here with me. I've got my Miami Heat cards, my favorite deck. I never, never lose with these things. Uh, these are the best cards that I have. You've probably played a game of cards where uh, you are just totally dependent on the cards that you're dealt. No, whatever game you're playing, it maybe it doesn't require a whole lot of skill or effort. It's just dependent on the cards that you were dealt, whether you're playing Euchre or uh, poker, maybe even go fish, right? Where it's just a matter of what you're dealt and then you've got to make do with the best that you have in your hands. So if you're watching with me today, I want to play a little game. It's a game called War. You probably know it's the simplest game ever invented in cards. You just, you get a card, I get a card, and we see who has the better card. So Ace is the best card and uh, we're going to play a little game. So these, listen, all right, this is a good deck. All right, I'm just going to pick a random card and I'm not cheating, I promise. That's your card, and this can be my card, okay? So, I'm gonna show you your card. This is your card, you're gonna see if you can beat me. I don't know what this is. I'm gonna take a look at my card. All right, I've got, I've got something average here. I've got an eight of hearts. You got the 10 of hearts, you beat me. You beat me with my favorite deck, and I just lost to thousands of people, probably, in a virtual game of war. So, I was totally dependent on the card that I was dealt, and I just had to make do with it. Here's the deal. Most of us, we don't know how to handle life when we get a chocolate that has a nasty filling in it, or we get a euchre hand that has nines and tens in it, and we don't know how to keep our faith when life gets difficult. 
and it gets rough. That doesn't have to be the case. That doesn't have to be how this story plays out. In fact, we learn from the scriptures that your weaknesses can actually be the thing that propel you the most in your faith. That's what I hope that you can see today. I want to walk through a text with you. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And so if you have a Bible with you or, or a Bible app that you can open, I want to encourage you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 as we navigate this text together. And we've been in 2 Corinthians the last few weeks, and we've learned that this is the final letter of uh, Paul's writings to the church at Corinth. And most of this letter, Paul is defending his apostleship. He's, he's talking about um, why he deserves to be apostle and the things that he's been through. He's talked a lot, a considerable amount of time about himself. But at the very end, part of chapter 12, he says some really, really interesting things as he wraps this up. In fact, scholars uh, don't have a mutual agreement of the complete meaning of all of these things that Paul writes here. But we can learn a thing or two about how Paul wants us to deal with life and what God wants us to learn as we walk through these words together. So we're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. All right, so here Paul gives us some interesting things to think about when it comes to struggles, the things that, that can break your faith. And through this text, I think that we can see a couple very important reminders for all of us when we're dealing with life's struggles. And so here's the first idea that I have for you. The first one is this. Your weaknesses keep you humble. The very beginning of this text is both very clear and honestly a little unclear as well in, in, in two different ways. Paul says he was given a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment him. Commentary after commentary and scholar after scholar have different opinions on what Paul meant by this thorn in the flesh. Some have su suggested it's a spiritual weakness, right? Or a temptation. Maybe some even have said that it's an emotional, an emotional vulnerability like depression or anxiety, something like that. But the use of the word flesh makes it seem that and suggests that it's some type of physical ailment or a disability. It could have been anything. In fact, this word thorn is also like translated from the classic Greek, it, another way to say this is stake, right? And so it's this idea or this picture of like a spear lodging it, itself into something, into the flesh, not like a minor annoyance or a pain in the neck, but like a, a chronic source of pain and anguish, so bothering that it hindered his ability to serve Christ. That's the confusing part because we don't really know exactly what it is or what he meant by this, but maybe the ambiguity on all of this is exactly how God had dictated the scriptures to be written. We don't have to assign one factor or one source of weakness, but rather recognizing that all of us, all of us have a weakness. All of us have something in our lives that creates pain, but what is clear, what is clear about this is why Paul tells us why he has it. He says, in order to keep him from becoming conceited, right? Why would Paul say this? You're going to imagine all of the things that Paul has experienced in his life, all the things that he's been through, all the things that he has witnessed as a follower of Jesus. He's been involved in a supernatural blinding and healing. He's seen miracles happen. He's, he's, he's been a part of healings and visions and, and so much more. He's seen a lot and he's done a lot. He's been around the block a time or two, right? And so at the beginning of chapter 12, he even talks about this vision that has been passed down to him from God. And, and so what he's saying is to keep him in line, 
and to remind him that he's just like all of us, he's just like everyone else, to keep him from being conceited, he was given this thorn in the flesh. What's interesting about this is that you'll see the dual assignment that, that we find from Paul as he attributes this illness or this weakness. He says he was given this thorn in the flesh, right? So that's to suggest that um, even though it was something difficult and caused pain, right, the, the, the idea that he was given it to him, this presumes that it was from God to keep him from being conceited, to keep him humble. It was from God, but he also calls it a messenger of Satan, which is, speaks of this chronic pain that it caused him. That's the nature of Paul's reality, right? This idea that he was dealing with something terrible, but he recognized that the terribleness was actually divine. So I want you to think of this. What's, what's your thorn in the flesh? What's your personal weakness or your vulnerability that causes you pain or hinders your ability to serve Christ? Maybe it's something you've had for a long time in your life that you constantly deal with. Maybe it's something that's happened to you recently. Some thorns are more painful than others, but all of us, all of us deal with something. And until we begin to recognize the weaknesses in our lives, those, those sources, the, the things that have uh, pain or frustration attached to them, then we can't move forward. I want you to think just for a moment what that, what that is for you. What is your thorn in the flesh? Whatever it is, whatever you, whatever you think that is in your life, please realize this. Whether you like it or not, your weakness, it keeps you humble. It puts you back in your place. It reminds you that you are not God, you are not in control and in charge of everything in your life. And that's difficult to hear because we don't like that. We, we want to be in control. And I got to be honest with you and tell you that sometimes I lose my patience as a father. I live with a four-year-old and a five-year-old that know everything that there is to know in this world, right? And sometimes, sometimes I have to remind them that they don't. And there are times where I melt down and do exactly that. Sometimes I'll be in the car with him and I'll hear it coming from the back seat, something like, you know, Dad, uh, this isn't the right way. And I just kind of shrug that off and think, you know, okay, whatever. And, and then not too long later, I'll hear it a little bit more loudly. Dad, Dad, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> and, and after a while, uh, you can't just ignore it. After a while, I just kind of look back there and, and, I, and I say something like, do you want to drive? Right? You, you seem to know the streets better than me as a four-year-old. Do you want to take the wheel? You, you want to get us there? And sometimes that's met with silence. Sometimes they try to take me up on it. Right? But this is, this is the idea. That I, I try to humble them and help them to realize that. Maybe a better example is trying to teach my four-year-old son how to swim. We've been doing that uh, recently. And um, kids are, want to be so independent, right? And, and, and there's a time that they need you, but they don't know that they need you, right? And so as we're teaching him how to sim, swim, he'll say things like, well, I, I can do it on my own. I'm like, no, you can't. Like, I'm holding your stomach, right? And you think that you're doing it on your own, but it's actually me who's holding you on top of the water. water. And after enough times of, Dad, I don't need you. Dad, I can do it on my own. Dad, let me go. I can do it. I kind of say something like, oh, really? You don't need me? How about I let you go then? How, how about I let you do it by yourself? And then he sinks, right? And of course, I, I pick him back up. And, and as I pull him out of the water, his, his eyes look at me. He doesn't even have to say the words. His eyes say everything to me. He realizes, I did need you, right? I, I did need you. And I, I can try to keep him humble, right? And sometimes you got to do things or say things to kids to teach them that way. But as Paul shows us here, as great as a man that he was, as great as a servant as he was, this weakness, the, the weakness he had was given to him to keep him from being conceited and to keep him humble. I want you to realize this truth today. Maybe the things that you deal with, the struggles that you have, are a part of a plan to keep you in a right relationship with God. I'm not telling you that everything that happens to you is a part of God's plan for you or that He causes you pain. That is not what I'm telling you today. P 
people's decisions, the brokenness of our world cause a lot of pain. Sin causes a lot of pain in people's lives. That's the reality of living in a broken world. But from Paul's perspective, from his perspective, it is possible that your weakness can be an instrument to keep you humble. There's so much more to say about this idea, and I want to continue on and, and talk about this next idea, which I think is this. Your weakness, your weaknesses create dependence on God. Paul said this in the text in verse 8. He says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. More and more I combed over this text and process the context and the meaning of this passage. I kept coming back to this phrase. My grace is sufficient for you. Paul begged God to take this away. Whatever ailment or, or, or weakness that this was, he asked God to remove it from his life so that he could serve Christ at full strength. And then listen, I'm sure that you've been there before. I'm sure there's been a moment in your life where you have begged God, you've asked God for Him to, to fix something, to do something, to remove something from your life. And if not you, maybe for someone else, someone else's illness or sickness or, or suffering where you've asked God to, to step in and to, to do something. My wife and I, we struggled for years to get, to get pregnant. And I remember those desperate prayers, asking for help and healing and, and pleading with Him to step in. I know what that feels like, to, to have that dependence on God through your pain and your struggle. We should do that. When people are sick, we should pray for healing. When people are struggling with addictions, we should pray for deliverance. When people have been wounded by the circumstances of life in this world, we should pray for their recovery. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think that we can learn that God wants us to make those petitions for us. We see that all throughout Scripture. He wants to hear from us. You should do this. In fact, if, if I find myself in the hospital, I don't want you to come and to pray for me and to pray like this. God, if it's your will, heal him. But if it's not, then let him suffer. No, I don't, I don't want to hear that type of prayer. Pray for my healing. Pray for me to be healed. Pray for my strength to be returned to me so that I can serve the church and I can preach Christ and His power before you usher me into glory. Give God a chance to heal me. When I was in India a couple years ago, this was the starkest contrast I saw in the prayers of our brothers and sisters there that serve the most vulnerable. We often give God an out, right? We say, God, God if it's not your will, then we understand, right? Of course we're going to understand. Uh, of course we will get that. But their prayers, they didn't have backup plans. They prayed for miracles. They prayed, they prayed for healings. They prayed for supernatural things to happen. And friends, it does. People of incurable illnesses being cured. People's lives being changed because of prayer. We have to see this in Paul's example here as something to follow. When you are dealt, when you are dealt a, a life a hand in life that, that is difficult, that is hard. Pray. Ask. But sometimes, sometimes the answer is no. And in your weakness, in your pain, in your suffering, in your ailment, you will learn to depend on God. You've already started the journey. By praying to God, you've started the journey of dependence, but that comes full circle when you have to learn to trust Him in the process. God says this, My grace is sufficient for you. This word sufficient in the Greek is this word archaeo. It means I suffice, pass, like passing on dessert. I am satisfied. I've got what I need. God tells us that His grace is, is all that we need in our weaknesses, in your desire to remove this weakness from your life or this vulnerability, I want you to know, God says, I want you to know in your desire for that, my grace is sufficient for you. Is there anything else that you need to be convinced of today? God's grace is all that you need. God's grace is all that you need to feel enough, 
It's all that you need to feel complete. It's all that you need to find purpose. It's all that you need to be accepted. It's all that you need to live the life that you were called to live. Do you believe this? Do you believe this truth? Do you believe that in your life that you don't need anything else? You don't need to find validation from other people. You don't need more money and a bigger house. You don't need to find anything else in this world to give you what you need other than the grace of God. We easily lose sight of this. We easily lose sight of this. He is all that we need. His grace is sufficient. It satisfies us. It satisfies our soul, and everything that you have been looking for in this world is found in God's grace. I want you, I need you to believe that truth today. This is comforting. We all hold on to this, but we have to ask why. Or maybe a better question is, is how? How do we do this? God says this. He says, my power is made perfect in weakness. What does that even mean, right? Is that one of those church sayings that we don't really understand what it means, but we all shake our head in agreement and and just say amen to it. God's power is on display in our weakness through your struggles, through your inadequacy, through your inability, and through your weakness. God's power is made perfect. In fact, the NLT translates this phrase as God's power works best. God's power works best in weakness, when you aren't enough, when you aren't good enough, when you have to learn to depend on Him is when you are made strong. When Dawson would try to swim and I would hold him up, that was the only way that he could do this. When he looked to me for dependence, he was made strong through his father. I mean, think of this. All of Paul's life is this principle on display right? All, all, his whole life is. Look what he says to Timothy as he writes a letter to him. That Timothy was a young pastor that he mentored. He says this to him. He says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in Him and receive eternal life. God's power on display despite being the worst of sinners. But here's the deal. It is only through God's no to Paul's request that he experiences this true dependence on God. That's a hard lesson to learn. And here's what I want all of us to see and to feel with this idea. Stop relying on yourself. Just stop. We try so very hard to do things in our life on our own power. We work our business, we raise our kids, we go to school. We do so many things in our own power, in our own strength, but maybe just, just maybe it is through the ways that we fall short through our weaknesses that teach us to rely and to depend on God's power and His wisdom. When we can't do it alone, when we cannot do it alone is when we, when we depend on Him truly. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power works best in weakness. In the face of weakness, we turn to God and ask Him to fill us, to make us strong. That's what this is about. There's one more idea. Maybe this is the most important idea, but maybe it's one that's not most recognizable as we look at this text. It's this. Your weaknesses can lead you to God's plan. Here's the reality. Sometimes God takes the thorn away, and sometimes, in His wisdom, He doesn't. doesn't matter how hard or long, or loud, you pray, sometimes he says no, and we have to accept his sovereign will. Whatever hand you've been dealt that you see as a weakness, or a struggle, or causing you pain, it could be. It very well could be the thing that is leading you to what God has 
in store for you. Many scholars have found Paul's reference to his thorn to be an indication that Paul was a sick man. Uh, it could have been anything, but many of them suggest maybe a malarial fever or, or something else. This would actually explain his short stay in Pamphylia, which is found at the beginning of Acts chapter 13 of all of Paul's journeys, of everywhere that he went. He had the shortest stay and quickest route through Pamphylia. And that led him to moving beyond the mountains and into Galatia. Now, Galatians chapter 4 would support this idea when Paul writes this. He says, Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. No, you took me in and cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Christ Jesus himself. This idea illustrates the notion that his illness or or his thorn, whatever this was, instead of closing a door to service, how we would often view something like this, instead of closing a door to service, it actually prompted Paul to venture forth and claim the Galatian towns for the gospel. That's the concept, that's the idea. Without this illness, Paul possibly would have had a, a different route or would have spent time somewhere else. But by viewing this through God's unique in sovereign perspective, he's able to understand and to see that this was his plan. Different idea, different concept, but Paul says the same type of thing when he mentions this in his letter to the Philippians. Philippians 1 verse 12 says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Paul realized that the things that have happened to him, whether a sickness, an illness, or, or a thorn in the flesh, or a difficulty, or a struggle, whatever it is, has prompted him to find what God has for him. So I want you to think about this. What if we started viewing our brokenness with a different lens? Right? What if we truly believe that no matter what happened to us, or, or the deck that we were dealt, whatever is in our way, or the struggle that we find ourselves in, is actually the thing that is pushing us to what God has for us. Wouldn't that change the way that you live? Here's what this looks like, because this is, this is an attitude thing, and you have to change your mindset on the difficulties of life. Here's what Paul says as we wrap up our text. He says this in verse 10. He says, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. He delights in his weaknesses, in his struggle, in his difficulties, because it brings about God's goodness. It's an amazing approach to the life that we live. The word that Paul uses here for delight is honestly something to consider. In the, in the Greek, it's this word, yodokeo, and it means to be well-pleased to think it good, to be well content. And here's what I want you to see. It's the same exact word, same exact word as what we find in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. When Jesus is baptized and he comes up out of the water and a voice from heaven speaks down and says, this is my son whom I am well pleased or whom I am delighted. Paul uses that same word as he talks about his attitude towards his struggles towards his weaknesses, towards his thorn in the flesh, because through it, he's made strong. Through it, he's made strong, and he finds God's strength in what God has in store for him. Friends, this is what it looks like in the world that we live in, to turn your weaknesses into strength. When life gives you a thorn, when it gives you a hardship, something that you are struggling with it, you delight in it. You are pleased in it because you know that those things are preparing you for whatever God has in store for you next. Not only did my wife and I learn dependence on God during infertility, but we also learned what He was doing afterwards. We learned how to comfort each other in a way that we didn't know how to before. We learned gratitude for kids, even when parenting is difficult. It was once we moved on 
from the thorn, from the, from the struggle, that we realize what God was doing, how He was working in us. This idea, it's echoed all throughout Scripture, but maybe even so much so in Jesus' own brother, James. Now we have to recognize and remember that James was not a follower and a believer in who Jesus was until after the resurrection. James' his whole life didn't believe a word that Jesus said until he saw him walk out of the grave and it changed his entire life. And when he did that, James rose to the top of the chain uh, among all the faith and, 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 and Christians because of his relationship with Jesus. And because of that, he suffered severe persecution in Jerusalem. And he knew the state of Christians, and so he wrote to them a letter, and this is how he opens it. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Trials, insults, hardships, persecution, these are the things that test our faith. These are the things that make life hard, and we are to consider it what? Pure joy? Why? Because it opens the door for what God has for us. Here's what I want you guys to see with all of this. Your struggles always have a purpose. Always. I don't know exactly what that is. It it could be to humble you. It could be to create dependence on God in your life. It could be to open a door for what God has planned for you next. Or honestly, it could be something else. It could be something else, but I want you to understand this idea. If you want to have an unbreakable faith in a fragile world, you have to think differently about the things that you deal with in your life. They don't have to be the end of you. So many of us let that be what happens to us in our faith. They don't have to break your faith. They can actually propel you to what God has for you when you remember the truth of the Scriptures, that your struggle always has a purpose. And when you can remember that, when you can remember that in the midst of it, your faith is unbreakable. And when your faith is unbreakable, the enemy is in trouble. When our church and our community is filled with people that have a faith that is stronger than the circumstances that they find themselves in, right? We are dangerous disciples of Jesus. We aren't sifted by the ups and the downs of life. They, they don't affect us that much because our faith remains steady and strong because we know that God is in control of all things. And even in the hard times, there's a purpose. So we've got to change our thinking. Whenever life gives us something difficult, whenever we're dealt a deck that we don't like, or, or we have to deal with a struggle, a pain, a thorn in the flesh, You think differently. You delight in them because you know that everything that you are dealt is just an opportunity for you to learn. It's an opportunity for you to grow or it's an opportunity for you to walk through a new door that God has opened for you for what He has planned for your life. That is my hope and my prayer for you that you would have an unbreakable faith by changing your thinking about how you deal with the struggles in your life. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for how you love us. We are so thankful for Jesus and all that he has done for us. We know that through his life and his death and his resurrection, our eternity is secure in him. And we are so thankful for for the salvation that is brought about by Jesus. But God, I also know that in this life that we live right now, we struggle. We have pain we have difficulties, we have hardships, all of us deal with something different. Lord, don't let those things be the end of us. Don't let those things break our faith. Don't let those things be the things that separate us from the everlasting truth that you are always with us. Help us to have an unbreakable faith even in the midst of struggle. I pray that you put that on our heart and you, to help, you would help us to think differently every time we face a hardship. It's my prayer, Lord. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.